Hello and welcome to another episode of Esports Boom. This week was much quieter than last week, but you know we're here for episode 10 to give our take on all the news that came out this week. Um, as always, I'm joined by my co-host Maurice Eisenman. And I think the more interesting, one of the more interesting stories that came out in the past week was uh, the backers of Cloud9. Maurice, do you have any thoughts? Well, let's first go through the facts. So this probably was the biggest story this week. So the new computer contributors to the company include WWE, the De- Beverly Hills Sports Council, Monumental Sports and Entertainment co-owner Raul Fernandez, CAA agency co-founder Michael Ovitz, venture capital firm Founders Fund, and a joint investment from famous investor David Sachs and Bill Lee. And then there were actually already investors that already invest in the previous round that now uh, added some money. So that is Hunter Pence, the San Francisco Giants outfielder and huge game fan. He will be a, a board member, a board observer who can sit on meetings, not a board member. And then others uh, include company Fun Plus, Sigma Ventures partners Rick Thompson, and Reddit co-founder Alexis Ohanian. What sticks out to you uh, out of all these names, out of all these organizations, which one sticks out most to you? A lot stick out to me, but I think the clear one is WWE. I love the WWE getting involved. I am so excited. I mean, they teased some esports things. They did some fighting games with WWE where they had their players play fighting games against each other. But there is no company, there's no sports league or tournament organizer that does digital storytelling better than the WWE. If you would have asked people five, six years ago if the WWE would be still relevant right now, they would have said no way. And they have been able to create an OTT service, uh, create a fan base that's young, and to do all of that digitally. And they're experiencing a huge resurgence right now. Absolutely. And, and, and it's perfect for esports because it's different and it's this fun storytelling. It's not that traditional sport, sports storytelling. And it's, it's what we need. No, and I think with esports players, with the amount of access they give their fans in terms of Twitch streaming, there's a lot more opportunity to develop interesting storylines. And I think having somebody like the WWE involved and, you know, either cross promotion, cross pollination, advising somebody like Cloud9 to do it, um, I think it's a huge win for Cloud9. If you look at any other, you know, LCS team or OWL team, you know, you have the NFL, you have the NBA, you have the MLB. But, you know, Cloud9, you know, they're the only ones with WWE. And I think that's incredible. I mean, just look at these investors because each and every one of them is interesting in a different way. So they have venture capital. They have the Founders Fund and David Saxon Bill Lee. They represent the traditional venture capital money. And they probably bring a lot of strategic knowledge behind with them. They have Monumental Sports and Entertainment co-owner Ralph Fernandez. I mean, we've said it enough on this podcast. Monumental Sports is incredibly innovative for what they're doing. The, um, obviously, they're also invested in Team Liquid, right? Yeah, but that's uh, what that's. I don't think it's Monumental themselves. I think it's Ted Leonis's. Okay. So, Raul Fernandez and Ted Leonis's will discuss these things with each other. You can you can bet on that. The WWE we just discussed. The Beverly Hills Sports Council is interesting. Because of the local LA connections. Yes. Yeah. And then what's really interesting to me is CAA agency co founder Michael Ovitz, because CAA, as we mentioned before in a podcast, is trying to get more active into esports. And if the co founder is investing in a company, that is extremely powerful. And then the former investors, I mean, Hunter Pence has become kind of this gaming sports personality besides you know besides baseball he's he's known for he he wants to open up a gaming cafe like he's a nerd and i say that with the with the best it's the best type of thing you can be but also of course alexis ohanian come on no it's right it's the biggest media company in the world to, in, in some respects in terms of its reach and online presence what's well, the biggest me it's the most important media distribution platform for news and esports okay i'll give it to them yeah so how amazing is it that, that you can have the co-founder on your team? Obviously, that will bring... I'm not saying he's going to change anything on Reddit, but it gives a, a humongous expertise and direct connection to the company. No, and I think that one of the things that we're, we've we been hearing for a while is that Reddit is going to evolve its product. You know, it can't, It's been pretty stagnant for a little while, and I know that they're working on a bunch of different things right now. Um, 
I've heard rumors that it's going to focus more on uh, individuals. So it's less focused on subreddits, but it'll allow you to create like, you know, uh, an account that matters. Um, and, you know, if if that is the direction that they're going to, there's a lot of synergy with having somebody like Cloud9 have a presence. And it's also to Cloud9's advantage to maybe, you know, either get preferential treatment or, you know, be in the beta test or just be one of the early adopters for the program. I mean, just for a fact, if one of the Cloud9 players, whether it's Overwatch League, whether it's the LCS, is going to do an AMA, I'm sure they get on the front page of Reddit, whether it's organically or not. Yeah, no, it's not organically or not, but it's like, you know, if there's a new feature or a new product, like, you know, I think it wouldn't be unethical to give Cloud9 beta access or to use them as testing. Absolutely not. No, I think it's great. I think, you know, it's 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 also a little bit cliche that the uh, it is a baseball player from San Francisco, basically from the Bay Area and Silicon Valley that's investing in all these things. I think it's kind of a... Uh, it's 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 great for him that he has an observer seat um, because I think that you know, that's you know sitting and listening in on all of these guys discuss these things. It's a it's a great way to prolong elongate your career after your baseball playing days are over. Of course, and I'm I'm calling it right now. When uh, Hunter Pence retires from baseball, he's going to uh, get heavy on Twitch or something like that, and he's going to be signed as a content creator to Cloud Nine. Nah, I mean maybe we'll see. So speaking of the Bay Area, we also had some news uh, coming out of Twitch. TwitchCon was last week, and they were they revealed a bunch of new features for their platform. Um, I'm just going to list them off real quick, and then we'll go over them one by one. So you have the stream summary, you have achievements, you have raids, you have premieres, you have rooms, you have subscription gifting, you have in-extension purchases, and you have rituals. A lot of these things were... Um, features that or experiences that users were creating by themselves that now just became formalized and uh, pushed out as a product or they were products or features that competitors had. So let's go over the latter category first. Um, let's see, we have rooms. Um, the guy on stage when he was describing rooms did a very good job of not mentioning Discord, but they're essentially trying to put Discord internally into Twitch. Yes, and also a little bit of Patreon, mm -hmm. because you can have special of these rooms that include like subscribers and people that follow you, because just like Patreon, a lot of times what people would do on Patreon, uh, you Twitch streamers would say, uh, pay, you know, five dollars a month to be on patreon once you do that you get access to my private discord yes so this way they're completely evading that and so the other feature that i saw that was that looked a little bit familiar to me was in extension purchases which felt very much like mixer um, i was playing around with it yesterday on ask josh ask josh's channel and it was basically an overlay that allowed me you know to uh, wager points on how well he could play the game and you know I could buy more points and I could support the streamer and it was interactive and it was interesting but it felt very much like Mixer. Um, so I feel like you know Twitch right now is trying to fend off Mixer, they're trying to fend off Discord, they're trying to fend off Patreon and maintain uh, all that traffic and all that business on their website. Um, stream summary I thought was interesting. I think it's always great to empower your users with uh, data just so that they can make the best decisions about their content. Um, I know achievements, it was a long pain point for how do you become a partner? It used to be this giant black hole of where people, you know, would beg and beg and beg to be a partner. Nobody really knew what the criteria were to become a partner. The process, I think, for a lot of it was manual. So, you know, there was a lot of uh, pressure on human labor. So well, one of the things that will be interesting to see is that I know for a fact that it's a lot easier to become a partner in Holland because there aren't a lot of, there aren't as many people watching Twitch. So they want to get native Dutch speakers to stream so they can gain an audience there. So it will be interesting to see if these types of things will go out to the public and that maybe the American streamers will be like, oh, how why well, how come they only need to have 100 concurrence for three, three, four weeks before they get a partner status and I need to get 200. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely an interesting crowd, but it's, you know, to Twitch's credit, it does incentivize users. I think one of the big successes that they also touted during their keynote was that they something like quadrupled their traffic in South Korea. Um, and I know that in Korea, you have Africa, you have, I think, several other streaming services. And the fact that Twitch was able to make inroads over there, that's pretty impressive. Absolutely. 
Um, so that was achievements. Raids. Raids have been going on for a long time. I mean, that's just awesome that they turned it into a product. You know, you're if you're signing off, you know, hook somebody else up with your viewership. That's definitely great. You know, prevent you know people from trailing off and going to a different website. Keep the traffic internal. Premieres. We saw companies like Team Liquid and One Up. They've been premiering their shows on on uh, Twitch, and you know it's fun for chat to basically discuss it during the initial premiere. I mean, primarily this is important because Twitch wants to get into more original content and more high quality content, and this is perfect because they'll probably give some boost when people premiere their content on Twitch, and it will give more of an incentive to content creators to create this type of content. Yeah, and. Kind of along that same trail of thought, have you been paying attention to the Yu-Gi-Oh! Marathon on Twitch right now? There's a Yu-Gi-Oh! Marathon on Twitch? Yeah, there's a Yu-Gi-Oh! Marathon on Twitch, and the whole community is in an outcry. So Yu-Gi-Oh! is super popular, right? You know, a lot of the Twitch audience really enjoys it. But for whatever reason, it's inundated, like, with an unreasonable amount of in-stream advertisements. Mm, and people are just that. throwing hissy fits right now. So I feel that that's, like, you know... And, you know, they, they had a lot of success with Bob Ross's, you know, painting marathon. They had some success, I think, with Power Rangers. Yes. But I think that, you know, when they're trying to basically stuff it with advertisements, I mean, it's rumored that Twitch is sitting at around an 80% ad block rate. I'm just curious what the end game for that type of content is. I mean, it's a lot easier to sell as to sell as to brands this type of content like Yu-Gi-Oh! because it's it's a known property. Are they just trying to take on Crunchyroll? Is that their next, you know? I don't think that that's what they're doing. I primarily think uh, that the sales team has a much easier time selling this type of, selling ads to this type of content. And therefore you see a lot more ads. But regards to Yu-Gi-Oh! it might be particular because of the way the video files are set up that they never had a one big episode, but they, they the original files were like, short parts because even in in anime in particular that's just the way it's set up like they know that they're gonna have tons of ads yeah Yeah, so they might have these breaks already and the ad sales teams just went crazy so what's the model come for doctor disrespect stay for the Yu-Gi-Oh. yeah (laughs) well i think it's just they they want to go into more of this original content high quality content because it's a lot easier to sell to brands in particular and these type of premieres can enable that, and it's going to make life a lot easier for the Twitch sales team. No, no yeah, and I think it's kind of interesting because I'm seeing the same type of effort being put into marketing Power Rangers and Yu-Gi-Oh as we saw maybe a year or two ago into marketing their music efforts, right? Because you had all you had what is it, uh, Ultron Twitch? You had a lot of these other big concerts, and now you're kind of seeing them take a step back from that and focus more on, um, you know the 90s nostalgia shows yeah or even original content like high quality content so what's their original high quality content i mean i know i know they do that one show which is fanboys i know they do another show which is like a sneakerhead show yeah. um are there any other ones well they just hired a high level executive i think from disney uh, and she is going to lead the original content department so you can see a lot of this type of stuff coming very soon okay interesting so we left off on premieres, rooms, that's basically Discord and Patreon in Twitch, subscription gifting. I think, you know, Twitch is, um, yeah, subscriptions have been incredibly lucrative for Twitch and successful for their partners. So being able to gift those is important. Partners have been asking for this for years. I remember a couple of years ago, I was talking with a very famous Twitch streamer and she said, I cannot tell you how many times my fans ask me, hey, Mike, you know, my cousin is new to Twitch. I want to give him or her a Twitch subscription to your channel to, to force force them to watch your content and get in, fall in love with your content. And the fact that Twitch hasn't enabled this. So the streamers in particular are very happy. Yeah. No, I mean, it's no brainer right there. And in extension purchases, there was one more actually aspect of this that I saw floating around on Twitter that they now incorporate uh, loot boxes and people are very upset because it's, the community's kind of hit this point where loot boxes are in every game. It's, you know, they're in PUBG, they're in Overwatch, now they're on Twitch. And it's gotten to the point where a lot of people now view it as like, you know, gambling light. So they say it's a bad thing to promote another podcast on your podcast, but I have to give a shout out to Robot Congress, which is Ryan Morrison's podcast. I mean, Ryan Morrison is one of the top video game lawyers out there. Great guy. And 
he has an incredible episode on this on this topic and the answer is yes it's gambling according to american law not according to english law so there might be some repercussions coming up for loot boxes pretty soon it's interesting because again it's like everybody i mean it's going to affect everyone yeah no interesting so that's an extension purchase rituals creators can set up special events to celebrate certain actions is that basically something that was all, uh, done by another platform and then twitch is just well i think tons of people use add-ons to do this type of stuff yeah. and now they just do it themselves okay so yeah you know bring everything in-house it's the equivalent of facebook buying instagram absolutely yeah use those parallels so i think great direction from twitch um you know some of these moves are definitely meant to protect their borders um, I think the their users are going to benefit from them greatly. I think it's going to streamline a lot of different things. Um, pretty happy overall. Um, yeah, and I think you know. Let's segue into our next story, which was um, Pringles is taking a large step into esports. Yeah, so Pringles, my favorite chips brand. I'm sorry, Lay's. They were actually one of the first major brands non-endemic brands to get into esports as you pointed out on twitter they have been sponsoring gambit esports for a long time already where they used to sponsor gambit mm -hmm. and um, according to dot esports they have been sponsored they had sponsored two seasons of the south korean nbc game star league which i think is a starcraft league in tw in 2006 so they have been active in esports for a really long time but now they're pro probably taking by far their largest investment by investing by sponsoring ESL's first Dota 2 major of the season, which is actually happening right now as we're recording this. So this is great. I mean, Pringles is one of those brands that, if I'm correct, is part of a, is part of a larger conglomerate of brands. Was that would that be Pepsi? Maybe it could be Pepsi. Yeah. So similar to having a Coca-Cola active in esports. Having a Pringles active in esports is great because if they do well, you can bet that their mother company as a whole. Didn't we see another investment from Pepsi last week? That we well, I think about? Mountain Dew is is active yeah. in Pepsi, and and they have been doing a lot of stuff. Pepsi has, PepsiCo has sponsored, I think, a Splice tournament a while ago, like a local tournament. So they're acting very heavily. But it's always good when, when these sister companies of these big mother companies are investing in esports and hopefully they see good results because that only will have positive effects because when all the CEOs are meeting at their monthly meeting or their yearly conference and they get together and they say, oh, let's talk about this esports thing and the CEO of Pringles will show their results. It has tremendous positive effects for the industry as all. Well. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's nice that Pringles kind of hovered around the they're going to make intelligent bets. They're working probably with some data from Gambit. Gambit back then was in the LCS, so they understand, you know, what value that brings. Um, so, no, I think it's a great move. Speaking of actually CEOs and important people uh, meeting, I, this isn't kind of on our list, but I, Bryce Blum had a great article this week on ESPN about how the NCAA is going to meet this week and discuss yes. esports. Um, and I think a lot of people in, in esports are panicking. And then Bryce was kind of like, you know, okay, yes, the NCAA definitely has its downsides. They're going to have some requests of the industry, some requests of the collegiate programs. Um, but he told them to, he, he basically tried to pacify the esports community by saying, you know, let give them a chance and see what they will do. Do you yes. have any thoughts? Yes, I'm kind of in between both opinions. I do, I would prefer... For the NCAA not to be active in esports, but I like Bryce. I see that it's probably going to happen. What unlike football, I think Riot and Blizzard will both put their foot down and say, "No, we have our our U League of Legends program. We have our Tespa program. We own the IP. This is not going to happen with our games." But there are tons of other games out there that that they can do it. Uh, what I do think is that the NCAA will need to change some of their things. Be more open to players streaming and making money that way playing for scholarships which might have a kind of snowball effect to the traditional sports things of the NCAA and I know the NCAA is scared of that yeah last time they were involved in video games was with the NCAA football games and basically what happened is they had to scrub all the names of the players because they were using their likenesses but they couldn't legally pay them and just a positive thing I know some of the people that are part of the RFP 
of the NCAA. Whether they, I don't know whether or not they made the final cut or they're going to talk about it, but I know there are some of the most important and most qualified people in collegiate esports. Whether they whether their presentations were held positively in regards to what um, what the NCAA want, I don't know. But hopefully one of them actually makes it through. So at least we have someone that is going to lead this program. Or is who's endemic to esports. Who's endemic to collegiate esports and yes. who knows what the collegiate student wants. And who, who can say, no, they need to be able to get paid through Twitch streams. They need to be able to play for scholarships. How do you think it's going to go over when somebody from esports goes and tells the NCAA no? Well, it was my, my big fear is not that. Um, my well, it's not a big fear. I hope this happens because I want collegiate players of any sports to be able to make some money, um, whether it's directly from the universities or whether it's be able to stream on Twitch or sell their advertising rights. So I think what's going to happen is, and I think the NCAA is getting into esports largely because of this as well. They're afraid that one day the top basketball player of let's say Duke University that's bringing in millions and millions of dollars for the for the university is going to see that Duke's Hearthstone player actually, you know, makes a grand a month by going to a local tournament and casting it or by streaming on Twitch or by selling his advertisements rights for the local GameStop or whatever it is. And the Duke University player who's bringing in a lot more money cannot pay for his food or, you know, his mom back home needs a new car and he has no money to pay for it himself exactly and he is going to become you know very upset with this and i think i hope this will lead to a snowball effect and this will lead to an eventual change the ncaa and i I think the ncaa understands this as a possible thing that's happening and that's why they're trying to appease both sides but i think that won't happen so you're saying that esports has the potential to be the straw that breaks the camel's back what does the world after ncaa uh, changes their stance on player revenues look like? How do you think that affects their business model? What does the world after that look like? You mean for the NCAA? For the NCAA, for the schools, for everyone. So I think there's some negative effects to this. First of all, the basketball programs will still do really well. Yep. The, they will bring in a lot of money, relatively less money, because they have to pay some of their players or the players will be able to sell advertisement rights. So if they're very smart, the NCAA will say from now on, uh, you know, your scholarship still is your payment, but you're allowed to sell advertisement rights. So you can go and sign an autographs in on your in your local Walmart, make a couple hundred bucks, and and do that. That will probably appease a lot of people. No, I don't think so. Because the moment that you you're allowed to make any type of money, you're gonna have agents, and with agents, it's like you know they're gonna be like I they're gonna try and negotiate for more and more and more and more. That's interesting. That could be that that's a that's a very interesting thing. I think what the biggest effect it's going to have is on the lacrosse team or the swimming team because a lot of times these NCAA basketball and football teams they support the lacrosse they support team. all the other programs. So I think what might happen, and this is very unfortunate, but it's the reality. It might affect the quality of the local lacrosse team that now won't have a live stream because they can't afford that. Or it might affect the local soccer team that doesn't have this equipment and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, so I think the, yeah, I, I agree with you that the victims will definitely be the smaller sports. On the positive side, it might cause more star NBA players and might cause more star football players to actually stay longer in college because if you're a, a good football player but you know you're you're gonna be a bench player on the giants and you know the money that you're making from being a, a third rate bench player on the giants it's not nearly the amount of money you're making from selling your advertising rights as the best player on the on your local college team no and that's actually interesting because i think then it also ter- creates a situation where the nfl and the nba to some degree become victims because if you look at what ha- what's going on right now in LA, you know they imported I think what two new teams in the past five years mm-hmm. or something, um, and what you saw was that the one college football game in LA brought more fans than two back to back NFL games. People have a loyalty to the school that they went to, sometimes much more than the loyalty they have to the city they just recently moved to, and especially if the NFL is playing you know musical chairs with all their teams, that combined with you know a, a more competitive NCAA that compensates players. It's something that the NFL should definitely be paying attention to. Absolutely. 
And but we're we're getting too far ahead. Let's let's move on to our next story, which is a story that went pretty unreported. That was pretty unreported. But Legardier Sports is going to distribute media rights to a new international esports event uh, together with Refresh. So Refresh is starting a new Counter Strike tournament called the CS:GO Blast Pro Series, which will be in Copenhagen in 2018, if I'm correct. Well, they have one this year, and then they have a couple more, and the last one will be in 2018. I think it's six events, and two of the first and the last are going to be in Copenhagen. Yes, and they. They will handle a lot of the stuff, but Legardier in particular will do all of the media rights, which is interesting because Legardier has a, had announced has announced a lot of sponsorship partnerships with a lot of teams. Splice, I think they do Ninja and Pajamas, so it's really interesting to see them move more into esports, uh, into this new field. I know Anton that you have a particular interesting uh, theory on this, so I'll give you the mic. So I'm putting on my Alex Jones hat. Everything that I say should be taken with a grain of salt. Um, and uh, I apologize in advance if any of this is incorrect, but I thought this was interesting. Um, some of this goes to, s- some credit should go to Richard Lewis, who is the one who initially brought this uh, inf- a lot of this information to light. So Refresh owns three Counter-Strike teams. I know that, I, th- I believe one of them is Astralis uh, mode. Can you help me with what the other two are? But there's, I know there are two other major teams, right? Yes, I'm blanking. Um, we're blanking on names. Anyway, so basically they own uh, three teams that are all competing in Pro League. This is the timeline. On June 29th, 2017, uh, Refresh announced that it raised $7.2 million in venture capital. In order to raise that money, they obviously had to show somebody a business plan and how they were going to generate revenue. No brainer. The following day, Wisa and Refresh announced that in order to stay compliant, Refresh had to divest its interest of the uh, of multiple teams and basically pick one. Wisa uh, gave Refresh an 18-month window in order to become compliant or face expulsion from Pro League. This was ha- this happened in June. Um, the Legardier announcement, which announced their tournament circuit, was in October, and the first event is going to be in November 2017, and the last event is going to be on November 2018. What's interesting is that November 2018, which is the date of the last Refresh event, is pretty much exactly 18 months uh, after the WISA ruling. So WISA is a, in essence saying they're basically giving okay they're basically giving Refresh a choice of operating their own model and leaving Pro League or divesting and continuing to go into Pro League. I mean the signs are here. The signs are here. You're all sheeple. Now I, yeah I think it has some value. Refresh has been. A, is a great company when it comes to just as a business plan. I think they do stuff really well. They tend to get a lot of good sponsorships. Their teams are doing very well. But on the other side, it's a it's also a conflict of interest, which is pretty clear. Owning multiple teams and then throwing a tournament. You know, ES Force is doing the same thing. They own venues. They operate tournaments. They own Virtuous Pro, Navi, everybody. Well, that's pretty bad as well. I don't think a league that has rules that are based on all the leagues, based on all, every team getting into the league is anything close to a team organizer owning a team so for instance the nba they have franchise spots and they have league rules and franchises that buy in understand the value of these rules now the nba some of the traditional sports people will say they used to own a team yes they did own a team because there were some issues with the previous owner but then their first move was to find a new potential owner because they did not want to have this conflict of interest i don't know i just feel like it's it's becoming so competitive in the esports space that you know i can't i can't fault refresh for doing what all of their you know competition is doing yeah, I I agree, but I still don't think it's good for a long term future of esports to have this type of yeah, stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I I just think that the publishers kind of change the rules of the game, and you know, it's it's a really messy area right now. I mean, I I'm I'm trying to think of you know what the right move is. Obviously, it's like you know there is risks to conflicts of interest, you know, collusion, all that type of all those types of situations. Um, I think the one that kind of just sticks out like a sore thumb is that, you know, Wisa kind of, you know, decided that it's okay. You guys can try it out for 18 months. So like what happens during these 18 months? It's just, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's such a weird situation to me. 
it's very interesting but i i understand some of Guisa's part because you can't like it, refresh has built a business so you're basically giving them time to yeah, if Guisa away. bears their teeth right now and people just laugh them out of the room, they're gonna they're never gonna grow into anything larger. So our last kind of news story is an interesting partnership between Genius Sports and DreamHack. So they announced their data rights and integrity partnership. So Genius Sport is gonna distribute the data and video streaming from DreamHack's esports events across the regulated betting market, but they will also use their integrity services to see that there is no threat of match, fix- match fixing. So I'm very excited about this. So for people who don't know, Genius, Esport- Genius Sports is actually a big player in traditional sports. So a lot of leagues, especially European leagues, but some Americans as well, work with Genius Sports to basically see if there are things like match fixing, betting. And it's very important because as esports moves into these play- these types of places, where there's large sponsorships and when there are large betting markets, sponsors don't want to have, obviously want to have match fixing. These types of stories that we had a couple of years ago and people are still afraid for now, they need to be, you know, we need to rid ourselves of them. And I'm very happy. Genius Sports is an incredible company. Uh, Moritz Maurer is leading the fray there for their esports department. And I'm excited to see some some company a company as big as DreamHack to do this. Another thing, what what was what said in what was stated in the article, was that they might use uh, some of their data services to um, to improve the production. So they might say like, oh, there's a 10% chance that this happens, and then you'll see that on the screen, or you'll hear a caster say about that, and that's great because it dramatically improves the production. What do you think, Anton? No, I think it's great. You know, it's you're dealing with a very young market. Some players aren't compensated that well by their teams. Um, you know, they may be tempted to do something that is unethical. And that does hurt the scene in many different ways. It's a terrible situation for any person to be involved in. And Genius coming in and kind of being the insurance policy to catch these types of things, to protect the sponsors, protect the tournaments, I think that's great. Yeah. And all right, so I think those are the big stories of the week. And uh, Mo was kind enough to put together a whole new segment that we're going to loosely call Who is Hiring? Yeah, so every month from now on, we'll look at, we'll highlight three to four jobs that are available and people are looking for, particularly in esports, because a lot of folks have reached out to us and have said, you know, how can we get into esports? Or I'm currently working for this company, but I want to move into a different role. And we thought it would be interesting to end our podcast uh, once a month with uh, this segment. So they'll be from a variety of, um, of stakeholders and in a variety of countries. So right away, we will st- our, our first job is a completely, is a European, co- well, I'll just restate that. So right away, our first job is a different country than the US and it's a completely different business. So Poorwell and Partners, uh, one of the top esports and gaming uh, law firms is looking for new lawyers and they're looking for a business development person. So it's one of the top esports law firms out there. They're based in London. Their clients inc- include people like CD Projekt Red, Fnatic, G2, and Riot. And they're basically saying, you know, we're expanding. I think they currently have about eight lawyers working for them. We're looking for more lawyers. We're getting tons of more, of more work. Uh, Jasper Wall and his team is basically saying, apply to us. And if we think that you fit our company, we'll hire you. So anyone in London who is looking to break into esports, particularly on the law side of it, or is looking to switch gears into a new industry, this is a job you should apply to. The second job is by our friends over at Prodigy Sports. Uh, They're a traditional sports recruiting company that recently moved into esports. They placed uh, Grant at Monumental Sports to run their NBA 2K and esports things. And actually, the NBA uh, has an opening with them. So they're looking for a director of player operations. So as, the, it's, as it's said, this position will be responsible for leading the operations of the NBA's recently announced NBA 2K League, as well as serve as the NBA's resident expert on esports. This person will also be responsible for player relationship and management. So it's going to be probably based in New York City, where the NBA offices are. Seven plus years of operations at media entertainment or sports company, two plus years of experience working directly in the esports and gaming sector, significant experience in esports league development, 
and um, you should apply via Prodigy Sports website. So they are really looking for someone who knows how to run a league um, and can help bring that expertise to the NBA. So if you have experience running esports leagues, I would say local, it's worth a shot, but especially if you're working with one of the bigger companies and you're looking to move into an NBA environment, which is a great environment to work in and an interesting league that's starting from scratch is definitely worth your time. And then finally, um, our friends over at FlyQuest are looking for a VP of content. So for those of you who don't know, FlyQuest is a top esports organization. Uh, they are in the NALCS that we discussed last week. They have a top Rocket League team and I think they have a PUBG team. The job is going to be based in LA. And basically, you're going to manage the strategy and creation of content. You will work closely with their director of social, digital media, and brand partnership team to think about concepts for partners. So creation of shows, oversee execution of branded content, uh, develop strategies for content distribution. So what they're looking for is really, they're only looking for people with eight plus years of experience working in a content strategy and particularly people that have worked in esports. So if I would say if you have been working in content for a really long time, but if you have uh, some significant esports experience, it is really worth looking into. And the best way to apply is through their website. I think it's flyquest.gg. So that's it for, um, for this month's Who is Hiring. And that's the end of our episode. Guys, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, if you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter at Joker Can't Spell. And Mo, where can people find you? If you can, you can follow me on Twitter at M R E I S E N M A N N. Thank you so much. 